So next we have Michael Armbrust, who is an Amp Lab graduate. He's now uh, a software engineer at Databricks, and today he's going to be telling us a little bit more about Spark and also about Spark SQL, which is a very uh, relatively new and very exciting component of, of Spark and actually something that Michael uh, created and is leading the development of. So thanks, Michael. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Amit. Uh, so like you said, my name is Michael Armbrust. I'm uh, the, a former student of the AMP Lab and the, the creator of Spark SQL. Um, I'm gonna kind of start diving down into the details to, to teach you guys a little bit more about Spark and Spark SQL. Um, so let's start off with kind of a, a high level overview of, of kind of Spark in general. Um, this will be pretty brief for those of you who are familiar, but I just wanna make sure kind of everybody's on the same page. Uh, so first of all, what, what exactly is uh, Apache Spark? Um, so it basically, I think the right way to think about this is it's a fast and general computing engine. It's completely interoperable with Hadoop. This means you can read your data from HDFS, you can read your data from Hive, you can read your data from S3, and it's included in all major distributions, as Jan said at this point. Unlike Hadoop MapReduce, though, and so really, you know, when you think about Hadoop, there's kind of two pieces to this. There's the, the Hadoop MapReduce, which is the computing engine, and there's, you know, HDFS. And so really, I think the right way to think about this is, is uh, Spark is replacing the MapReduce side, the, the computation engines of things. And when you compare it with Hadoop MapReduce, there's some key differences. Uh, the first difference is it's going to improve the efficiency significantly. Uh, and the way it does this is by having both the ability to do computation in memory, and I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but it's not only in memory. This is kind of a, an optional uh, benefit of Spark. Um, and in addition to that, it also has these more general computation graphs. When you write something in Hadoop MapReduce, it is map followed by reduce, and then you dump to the file system. And in Spark, you can actually build up kind of significantly more complex pipelines without ever having to spill the disk, which is another way you get increased efficiency. And what this means to you as a developer is that when you write something in Spark instead of MapReduce, it can be up to 100 times faster. And even when it's running on disk, it can still be two to 10 times faster. Um, but really, you know, kind of the, the time to actually execute your job is not really the, the only important thing here. You really care about the, the total time to answer, from the time I sit down in front of my computer to the time I, I get the result I want. And this is another place where I think Spark has really innovated on top of Apache MapReduce. Uh, and the idea here is that it's going to improve usability for you as a programmer um, with a rich set of APIs in a variety of languages. So we've got Scala, Java, Python, and SQL. Um, and then it's also got this notion of an interactive shell, which you guys will get to play around with uh, later today during the exercises portion. And what this means is that when you're writing a program, it can often be two to five times less code, which means you can be more efficient as a programmer. So how does Spark express this? What is, what is kind of Spark's model for, for working with data? And the right way to think about this is understanding this concept of an RDD, or a resilient distributed data set. This is kind of the, the core abstraction. Um, when you have an RDD, what it is, is it's a representation of some data set that is actually distributed throughout the machines on your cluster. Um, and you can kind of tell Spark if you want to keep these objects on disk or if you want to persist them in memory so that you can access them more quickly. If you're going to be reading them multiple times. And, and then the key idea here is that RDDs are immutable. So I, I can't change them, but what I can do is I can transform them. So I apply these parallel transformations to them. A map, a map, for example, takes a single item and transforms it to another item, a filter, a reduce, um, kind of all of these sorts of things. And then the really cool thing is um, when you start running on large clusters of machines, you end up having a lot of problems with failures and other things. And because of the, the power of the Spark model, all of this is kind of abstracted from, away from you as a programmer. Kind of when there is a failure, Spark understands uh, the lineage of your computation will automatically recompute it. So, you know, kind of the, the key point here is it, it's like MapReduce, but it's actually quite a bit more than MapReduce. Uh, when you have an RDD, you can do kind of a, a wide variety of transformations. This is actually just an, a, an abbreviated list. So let's jump into kind of a, a more concrete example. Maybe some of you have seen this before, so I'll go through it kind of quickly. Um, but, you know, one kind of common thing you want to do is that, you know, I've got a ton of log data. And I, something's gone wrong in my production system, and I want to track down what went wrong and, and kind of figure that out, that, that out very quickly. So um, you know, basically, you'll start off with your cluster of machines. So uh, the driver is where your Spark program actually runs. And then you have a set of workers that actually hold the data and are going to do the computation. So I'll start off by creating a, a base RDD. Um, so in, in this example, um, I'm using this, this method on the Spark context. So right here, you, you have this object called Spark. Uh, when, you, when you load up the Spark REPL, it's called SC. 
Um, and from this, basically what you're doing is you're creating an RDD from this base data set. So this is, this is the base RDD. So it's going to load this data off of HDFS or S3 or wherever it's coming from. And now lines is representative of, of all of that data distributed throughout the cluster. Now, an important part to realize about Spark's computation model is at this point, nothing has happened. No data has been loaded, no transformations have occurred. I'm just telling Spark what the lineage is for the computation I want to do. And it's not until I actually perform an action that something is going to occur. And this is an important concept because it actually allows Spark to be more efficient. When you do multiple transformations in a row, instead of doing them eagerly right away, what Spark will do is it will batch them up and smash them down into a single job that will occur in a pipeline fashion. So once I've loaded the base data set, now I want to start transforming it into a form that, that I can actually understand. So uh, kind of the first thing I'm going to do is, well, I'm, I know something went wrong in my cluster, so I don't care about all the lines that aren't about errors. So I'm going to start by filtering it. So this example's in Scala, but I'll have examples kind of later on in Python. And what you're seeing here is I'm passing to the filter function a, a lambda function, which basically says take each line of text and only return the ones that actually start with the word error. And any line that doesn't match that uh, will, will not be returned in the data set. So now I have a new transformed RDD called errors that is based on the lines RDD, but only has the lines that contain errors. And like I said, no work has actually been done yet. All I'm doing is building up lineage. So now, now that I've got that, now I actually want to do some kind of more complex munging. So we'll start by actually splitting it up into fields so I can understand the different parts of this. And this is kind of where the, the generality of Spark's computational model comes in. Uh, you know, if you were comparing this with kind of a traditional database, this is like, think of this like UDFs, but they're incredibly easy to use UDFs. Um, so now I'm able to kind of split this up based on tabs. Um, so now I'm going to split this and take the third column from, from this data file, and I'm going to call that messages. And I know that the messages data set is actually something important. I'm going to want to do a bunch of queries over this. So instead of repeating this computation of loading it from HDFS, filtering it, and splitting it, I, I want to kind of save that in memory. So I'm going to tell Spark to cache it. So I'm going to call dot cache on the messages RDD. Once again, this is lazy. But what it's saying is that when, you, when you're telling Spark, when you actually compute the values of this RDD, keep those partitions around in memory. So now I'm actually going to do an action. Now I, I've, got some, I've got some hypothesis. I think the reason my production system is broken is because of foo. So let's see how many of the errors were actually related to foo. So um, I'm going to do another filter, and then I'm going to do a count. And count is what we call an action. So this is when computation is actually going to occur. So I say dot count, and what's going to happen is Spark is going to start by loading all of the partitions in parallel on all of the machines in the disk. So it's kind of reading them off of S3. So we send the tasks out to the data. Uh, the, the data is read, and the results are sent back to the system. So now I, back on my driver, I've got the count of messages that, that match foo. But because I said to cache this, what you're going to see is actually the, those messages partitions are now cached in memory. So if I decide, so you know, foo didn't turn out, there were no, no messages that matched that, now I'm going to look for some, some other hypothesis. And so now I'm going to look for bar instead. And the cool thing is now when I do this, this action again, Spark is going to realize that it's already computed the messages RDD. And so when it sends the tasks out to the worker nodes, it's going to read from that in-memory data instead. And then return the results, and you get the count. And kind of the result of this is it allows you to do very fast interactive analytics, even over large sets of data. So kind of one, one example here is this allows you to do full text search over all of Wikipedia. And this is not using some clever index. It's actually scanning all of the text of Wikipedia in less than a second. And even if it's on disk, uh, you know, it would take 20 seconds. And a nice thing here is this actually scales up to, to very large amounts of memory. So you know, even if we go up to a terabyte, uh, you can actually still query that in five to seven seconds versus 170 seconds off disk. So that's kind of the, the high level vision of the, the Spark stack. Um, but really, you know, I'm here to tell you today uh, about Spark SQL in general. Um, but before I do that, I kind of want to talk about kind of the power of this stack and the programming abstraction, abstractions that it provides. Um, so this is only one metric, and you know, certainly not the only metric for evaluating software, but kind of one way to think about complexity in software is the number of lines of code. It's kind of the, the cognitive load that any programmer working with the system is going to need to kind of keep in their head in order to be effective. And so this is a comparison of Spark along with a bunch of other kind of much more specialized systems. 
And I think one of the coolest things about Spark is not only that it's you know, a very simple, powerful abstraction for you to use, but that it allows you to build complex, specialized abstractions on top of that. So as an example, kind of one of the first things that was done with the Spark stack was uh, we, there was this project Spark Streaming. And so you can see, compared to a specialized streaming system, because Spark Streaming is able to leverage the existing power of the RDD computation model, it's actually relatively easy to build a streaming system. And a really cool anecdote here, um, when they actually built the streaming system, one of the things they had to do to make it work well was improve the task scheduler. And as a result of improving the task scheduler, all of the SQL queries running on Spark got quite a bit faster as well. So there's also this system called Spark SQL. So you know, again, kind of a relatively small delta on top of that. And GraphX, another system, kind of all of these specialized engines are able to be performance competitive while just building on top of, of, of the, the abstractions already provided by Spark. So you may be saying, OK, well, that's great, but I'm not a Spark committer. Why do I care about this? But I think the important thing to realize is this could be your app as well. All of these abstractions that we're building on top of Spark you know, are kind of purpose-built for one thing, but we're not changing Spark core. We're just building on top of the RDD programming model. And so I think this is one of the reasons why the community growth for Spark has kind of just continued to take off as we go. So Jan talked about some of the numbers of committers, but it's kind of one of the, the most popular open source projects out there at the moment. One other uh, kind of fallacy I would like to dispel is this notion that Spark is really about in-memory data. So it's true, Spark is great at kind of caching things and keeping in memory to allow you to do iterative computations more quickly, uh, but it's actually quite a bit more than that. Uh, so recently there was a bunch of press around um, this uh, new record for sorting uh, 100 terabytes of data in a record 23 minutes. And one of the really cool things is here, Spark was actually able to compete with a system that was built for over a year to just sort integers. So kind of by using the Spark stack, you know, this much more general computation engine, we're actually able to be competitive with these kind of incredibly purpose-built uh, systems. And really, it was able to kind of smash the record uh, for, for the previous, uh, for, for this benchmark. Um, so you know, la the last time this was done uh, was at Yahoo using Hadoop. And using, I think it was like 10x less machines, it was actually still able to be two to three times faster. So you know, m more efficient, faster, easier to program against. What's that? Oh, and, oh yeah, and, and Amit's got a good point. There's actually going to be an entire talk later this afternoon going into the details of what we had to do to Spark to, uh, to beat this record. OK, so that's, uh, that's enough Spark overview. Uh, now I'd like to start talking about Spark SQL in particular. Uh, so like Jan said, this is actually the newest component of the Spark stack. It had its uh, one-year birthday uh, one, uh, about a week ago. Um, it's a, basically a tightly integrated with Spark way to work with structured data. So really, you know, we consider not even calling it Spark SQL because I think that's actually selling it a little bit short. Anytime you're working with data that looks like a table, anytime you've got rows and columns and you know the data types, you should think about using Spark SQL and I'll, I'll kind of go into some of the reasons for that. Um, but what it allows you to do is it allows you to take these, these tables, represented RDDs, and instead of writing imperative code to run against them, you can actually now transform them using a higher level language language like SQL. And uh, you know, there's a lot of advantages to writing at a higher level, but really I can think a key thing here, which I'll be kind of going on and on about it during my talk, is this idea of higher level declarative programs. When, when you write in SQL, what you're doing is you're telling Spark what data you want to retrieve or what computations you want to perform, but not necessarily how to perform them. And by leaving it up to the system, you allow it to do the optimization for you. It can figure out which columns it wants to read from disk and kind of configure the, the input formats correctly. And, and kind of a lot of that can be done without you having to do that extra work. So when it's a good fit, it can actually be quite a bit more efficient than, than writing standard programs. Um, and then kind of another kind of key feature here uh, of Spark SQL is this notion of data source integration. So this is really kind of the narrow waste by which we think about getting uh, structured data into Spark. So if you're working with data that's already stored in Apache Hive, if you're working with data stored in Parquet or JSON, we've got formats that can actually bring those in and automatically transform them into schema RDDs. And I'll be going through the details of those in, in uh, slides in a couple of minutes. So uh, yeah, Jan kind of alluded to this, but a question I get very often is, you know, what happened to Shark? Um, so first of all, a little bit of background. So Shark was another system that you know, did SQL on top of Spark. Um, and there was kind of a key architectural difference. Uh, when, when Shark was built, uh, the way it was done was basically they took Apache Hive, and they took the parser, query planner, optimizer, and took the result of planning the MapReduce job that should execute that SQL query, and just replaced those MapReduce steps with Spark. 
So that was great because it actually allowed Hive to run over 100 times faster with lo relatively limited modifications. Um, but there were kind of two challenges to this approach. One was it had limited integration with Spark programs. So basically, you were writing a Spark program or you were writing SQL, and it was very difficult to mix the two. And another problem here was kind of the Hive optimizer was not really designed to work with Spark. Um, kind of one of the, the key features of Spark SQL is this new optimizer framework called Catalyst. It's actually started out of a, a research project that I was doing at Google before coming to Databricks. Um, and the idea here is it, it's this flexible framework for describing how you would do optimization. Um, and as a result, the optimizer for Spark SQL is quite a bit closer tied to the RDD model itself. But you know, we didn't completely abandon Shark. There were a lot of great ideas there. And so when we built Spark SQL, what we did was we took the best parts of Shark, so in particular, the tight integration with Hive. So if you've got existing code in, in a Hive data warehouse, uh, you can kind of pull it out very easily. And then we also took the efficient in-memory columnar storage format, which I'll be talking about in a couple of slides, and kind of brought that in. And then we replaced it with this RDD-aware optimizer and also these rich language interfaces, which I'll, I'll be talking about as well. So you know, when I started this talk off, I said one of the, the key things to understand about Spark is this notion of an RDD. And you know, with Spark SQL, we have kind of a, an analogous concept that is a schema RDD. So um, you know, when you're working with Spark, um, basically the way to think about an RDD is you've got these functional transformations, so these lambda functions that I'm, I'm performing on, on top of opaque objects. So you know, this is partitioned across the cluster, and we get a lot of parallelism. So there's a, a lot of great performance here. But one of the key things to understand is that Lambda function that you give to Spark is a black box. It's completely opaque to Spark. It doesn't know that you're only reading one of the columns out of 100. And so it can't perform optimizations for you. Um, when you work with Spark SQL, instead, you're doing these declarative transformations. You're saying, you know, select name from this table. And Spark understands exactly what the expressions are that you're evaluating. Um, and the other thing is it actually understands the structure of data as well. Instead of just seeing this opaque uh, Java or Python or Scala object called user, it actually knows that you have three columns, a name, which is a string, an age, which is an integer, and a height, which is a float. And you know, kind of by having all of that extra structure, um, you can actually get quite a bit more performance as a result. And a key thing to understand is we really try to blur the lines between the functional transformations and the declarative transformations so you can relatively easily go back and forth between schema RDDs and RDDs. It's very important to understand that a schema RDD actually is an RDD, so you can do anything on it that you can do with normal RDDs, but you can also run SQL on them. So like I said, it's, it's, it's actually quite a bit more than just SQL. It's actually about a unified interface for working with structured data. So you know, basically, schema RDDs sit at the middle. And at the bottom, we've got a variety of storage formats, which I'll be talking about in detail. But we support Parquet, JSON, Hive. And there's ongoing work to integrate with Cassandra. And then you know, to all of these data formats, through schema RDDs, you can access your data through JDBC or ODBC, uh, Python, Scala, Java, HiveQL. And then we're even working on kind of tighter integration with MLlib. So you can view tables in Spark SQL as data sets, which can kind of be automatically uh, dumped into off-the-shelf machine learning algorithms. Whew, OK, so that was kind of a, a high-level overview uh, of Spark SQL on the project. Um, let's dive into, uh, uh, into the, some code and kind of how, how you actually use the system. So when you're working with Spark, you have this notion of a Spark context. And it's kind of very similar to Spark SQL. Uh, you create a SQL context. I'm going to do these examples in Python. But like I said, you know, we support all, all three languages pretty well. Uh, the, so kind of just go to the programming guide, and you can kind of see how, how to do it in the language of your choice. Um, but basically, all you do, you start by instantiating a SQL context. And you pass in the Spark context is the only thing you need to do to, to kind of start this off. Um, one thing to understand, which people are often confused by, uh, what is the difference between a SQL context and a Hive context? So um, because Apache Hive is kind of a, a fairly large project, it's over a, thousand, a million lines of code, and it has quite a few dependencies, it doesn't ship with the default version of Spark. It's actually kind of a, a separate component that you can optionally bring in because we didn't want it to break existing Spark applications. So if you're one of those people who has a conflict with some of the libraries in Hive, you can use a SQL context and kind of get a lot of the power of Spark SQL without having to bring in any Hive libraries at all. However, uh, you know, the integration with Hive is actually quite powerful. So if you're starting off the shelf and you're you know, from, from Greenfield, I would strongly consider uh, using the Hive context instead. 
When you use a Hive context, you get access to Hive UDFs. You get access to data stored in Hive. Um, you also get a, a, uh, access to Hive QL, which is kind of a much more powerful query language than the simple SQL parser that comes built into Spark SQL. So once I've created my context, uh, the next step is you know, to take my data and actually transform it into a table. So in this example, I'm going to be starting with just a simple text file. So this is very similar to the, the RDD example that we, we started the talk off with. But this time, instead, I want to turn it into a table. So uh, I'm going to start off very similarly. I'm going to take uh, you know, the Spark context. I'm going to call text file. Uh, and so this will take the, the people's text file, split it up by lines, and give me back an RDD, where each entry in the RDD is a single line from this text file. Now I want to transform it into the form that I can use inside of Spark SQL. So I'll start by breaking it into parts. So I'll just call split, and it's comma separated, so I'll, I'll split it on commas. And now I want to assign names to the columns of, of each of the f uh, values inside of this, this text file. So now I'm going to call it people, and I'm going to do uh, another Lambda function. And in this case, I'm going to construct a row object. So this is kind of a, a Spark SQL concept. And what you do is you just name the columns using keyword arguments. So the name is the first thing from the text file, the age, well, I'll convert it to an int, and it's the second thing from a text file. And now I've got back an RDD of rows, which can be turned into a schema RDD. So I just take that and pass it to the SQL context saying infer schema. And what this does is it actually scans your data set. And since Python is a dynamically typed language, it tries to figure out the types of each of the columns and then returns to you a, a schema RDD, in this case called people table. So once I've got a schema RDD, I can do any of the schema RDD operations on it. So for example, I can register it as a table. And once it's registered as a table, I can run SQL queries on it. But I could also do kind of other standard RDD operations on it as well. So that example was in, in Python, but I want to go through for, for the Scala people in the audience as well. Uh, kind of in a, in a very similar way, uh, what you do is you create a SQL context. Um, in Scala, you can actually import the SQL context. And what this is doing is it's giving you access to all of the implicit conversions. So this is kind of the, the very tight language integration that I was talking about before. Um, so by doing this now, kind of a, a lot of magic is going to happen underneath the covers. A lot of your RDDs can automatically become schema RDDs. So in this case, instead of creating a row object, in Scala, the way that you express uh, kind of the structure of your data is through case classes. Uh, you can think of a case class like a Java bean, for those of you who aren't super familiar with, with Scala. Basically, by putting the word case here, I'm just telling the Scala compiler that I want each of these to be publicly accessible, so it automatically creates the getter methods, the equality function, the two-string function, kind of all of that stuff to create an algebraic data type for you. So I'm saying I'm going to have this, this concept of a, a data type called a person, has a name which is a string, an age which is an integer. And now, very similar to Python, I'm going to take my text file, split it by commas, and map it into these people case classes. So now I've got this, uh, this new RDD called people, which is an RDD of case classes. And the cool thing is, because I imported SQL context, any RDD of case classes can just be used as a schema RDD. And what's going to happen is when I call a schema RDD operation on it, in this case, register as table, it's going to realize, oh, well, that doesn't, you can't do that with a normal RDD. So it'll ask the Scala compiler for the schema and then kind of automatically convert it into a schema RDD. And now I'll have a, a, a table called people. And by the way, this is kind of like relatively low level and technical. So if there are questions, please feel free to interrupt. I'm happy to take them at any time. Um, this is a Java example. I won't go through it too deeply, but basically the, the idea here is instead of creating a case class, I create a Java bean. And so you just have to create the getters and setters, map it into this class, and then you call apply schema and pass it the class so that it can, it can actually get the, the schema of that class. So in all of these cases, I'm, I'm just taking my data, applying structure to it, and then turning it into a schema RDD. So the really cool thing is, once it's a schema RDD, now I've got all of the power of SQL in addition to kind of the, the standard RDD operations. So um, basically, I can just, anything that's registered as a table can be queried using the SQL method. Um, you know, it's kind of fa fairly standard SQL. So in this case, I want, if I want to find all of the teenagers, I want their names and I want to bound their ages. And the result of any SQL query is actually also a schema RDD. So all of this is very similar to the, the standard Spark computational model. When I run a SQL query, nothing is actually happening. I'm just building up the lineage. So you know, there, there can be more optimization that occurs. And so teenagers still, no, no work has actually been done until I actually call a collect or a count or an action on this RDD. 
And so a nice thing is, since it's still an RDD, from the result of a SQL query, I can immediately go back to doing Lambda functions. So if I've got some operation that doesn't fit very well into SQL, you know, I want to do some text munging or some more complicated processing, I can take my SQL results and immediately do uh, kind of other, other forms of programming. So this is the, the very tightly integrated UDFs that I was talking about before. Another nice thing about kind of the, the SQL paradigm is there are a lot of existing BI tools and other tools that understand SQL. And you know, Spark SQL is kind of the, the gateway to allowing you to access data in HDFS using these existing tools. Um, so we've actually partnered with uh, um, Simba to provide an ODBC driver and also with Tableau. Um, so basically, the, the nice thing here is you know, normally these tools are locked into kind of your traditional Oracle or MySQL or things like that. But really, this is unlocking data that you've got stored in HDFS or S3 that you can now use through, the, through these tools. And it also means you've got access to all of the data formats that Spark SQL has access to. So if you've got a directory full of JSON files, you can actually mount that as a table and expose it through, through Spark SQL's JDBC or ODBC server. And then another really nice thing about the server is it also supports the ability to cache things in memory. So a question that I get very often is, I've got a bunch of developers, and I've got a cluster. I want to share that memory for all of these developers. I want to allow all of them to do interactive querying of the same data set. With Spark alone, this is actually a little bit difficult to do, because uh, you either need to use Tachyon, which we'll, we'll be talking about next, or you kind of need to put a server interface in front of it automatically, because the data that's cached in memory is always tied to a single Spark context. With the JDBC server, it, you've kind of got this server interface that multiple people can connect to and, and kind of pull, pull data out of easily. So I've been talking a lot about caching in memory. And one thing I really want to kind of emphasize is that when you cache da data in memory inside of Spark SQL, it's different than doing it in just normal Spark. Uh, so actually what we do is we kind of re-encode the data using an efficient in-memory columnar format. And the nice thing here is you kind of limit the amount of memory bandwidth that you need when you read the data back, because we only scan the required columns. Um, we also allocate significantly fewer objects, and we automatically select the best compression. So if you want to use caching inside of Spark SQL, all you need to do is call cache table, tell it a, cable, a table name. All queries over that table will then, then be cached. And starting with Spark 1.2, we actually also override the default version of caching. So if you say .cache on a schema RDD, it will automatically use our more efficient columnar caching instead. However, a caveat here, if you're using Spark before 1.2, don't call .cache on a schema RDD. It'll actually use the, the kind of standard caching. Um, it's much more efficient to call cache table instead. So what? Yeah, so yeah, it's a great question. So in terms of roadmap, uh, we're actually in the middle of the QA period for 1.2 right now. So actually, as soon as I give this talk, I'm going to go back and merge in the like final uh, blocking bug patches. Um, and we'll, so I think basically the, the schedule is we're hoping to get an RC, like our first release candidate out, either this week or next. Uh, and then you know basically the, the voting process will begin. And as soon as it's, uh, it's done, we'll have a release. Um, really, I think kind of early December is the, the right time to be expecting. Um, but we've done a ton of QA on this release. So you know, if you're an existing Spark user, I strongly encourage you, check out the RC. Let us know if you're seeing any regressions. We, we'd love to fix them right away so this can be, this can be a great release. Yes? Ah, that's a really good question. So all schema RDDs are RDDs of row objects. So a row is kind of just a container for holding different columns. You can access each of the fields by, uh, by ordinal. So you say like, you know, row parentheses zero to get the first column. Um, you can also say get string or get int if you want to, if you know the types and you want to get specific types back. Um, so yeah, so basically it's RDD of row objects when you go into normal Lambda functions. You can also call dot schema on a schema RDD to actually figure out what the names and types of those individual columns are. Yeah, no, you don't. Yeah, we actually, basically, during analysis, we calculate what types need to be propagated throughout the system. So all of that will be preserved, even when you're saving out to the various data formats. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit. So um, the, the caching in, in Spark SQL is actually a little bit different than in standard Spark. Uh, in standard Spark, when you say in memory only, so this is kind of one of the storage levels for caching. Um, so basically, what you're going to end up with, you know, going back to our user example, you have a bunch of user objects. And then you also have kind of other objects that are hanging off of these user objects. So in this case, I'd have a string for each user name. Um, when, you, when you cache something inside of Spark SQL, 
Instead, what we do is we allocate a single byte buffer per column per partition, and then we encode the data into that. So what this means is instead of having all of these objects lying around on the heap, I have a single buffer for, for each column, which is actually quite a bit more efficient in terms of the GC, um, which actually I, we, we see kind of significant performance benefits uh, w w when using this. And also, uh, the other thing is when we do this encoding, we automatically select the best compression. Um, so kind of we, we, we see pretty, pretty big performance benefits. So something to consider even if you're not using the SQL part of Spark SQL. Um, another thing we've got is we've got tightly integrated language uh, or language integrated UDFs. Um, so you know you can also do dot map, but if I want to do things inside of SQL, uh, you know I don't even want to leave SQL. Um, basically, what you can do is by calling register function on any SQL context. This works in Python. This works in Java. This works in uh, in Scala. All you need to do is give it a name and give it a lambda function, and you've got a UDF. So kind of compare this with Hive, where I have to kind of create a class, implement some methods, compile a jar, upload that jar to my cluster, register it. You can, in one line, say register function, and in the next line, you can start using it inside of your SQL statements. And it's using all of the magic already built into, into Spark for shipping closures around the cluster to make this work. Um, another kind of cool thing is, you know, it, it's not just Spark, it's not just SQL, it's actually the entire Spark ecosystem. Uh, so a kind of a very kind of cool use case here is when I got some data, I need to do some ETL, and then I want to do something very complicated like machine learning on top of it. You can kind of shoehorn machine learning into, into SQL databases, but it's not always the easiest thing to do. Uh, so instead, kind of, I think you should do what's great in SQL and then you know, do what's great in imperative programming. So in this example, um, basically, I, I want to predict the actions uh, that my users are going to take in the future based on past actions of similar users. So kind of step one is I've got this users table and I've got this table about events and I want to do a join. This is something that you know, SQL is great at. Spark SQL has kind of quite a few different join algorithms and we'll pick the best one automatically based on data sizes. Uh, so you know, we're going to do this join and then we're going to extract this demographic data which will be the features for my machine learning algorithm. So I run this SQL, I get back an RDD. So again, no, no operations have actually occurred here. And then I want to actually featureize. I want to turn it into the form that MLlib is expecting. So I write this function that does featureization. Uh, in Python, you can actually access the um, columns inside of a row just by calling into them by you know, dot name. Uh, so now I'm actually going to create the training data by just taking the table and featureizing it. And once it's in the form MLlib requires, I can drop it directly into this training function. And the cool thing is, all I've done is built up lineage here, and then when I actually pass it in here, all of the work is going to be done in a uh, kind of a single optimized fashion. And you know, so that's kind of a cool example, but we're working quite a bit on the integration here between MLlib and, and Spark SQL. So in this example, I can actually load data from our Parquet file. It comes out, you know, so one, one of the things we did was actually now Spark SQL understands things like sparse vectors and dense vectors. And when I save a sparse vector out to Parquet, it uses an efficient format to save it out, and when it comes back into Spark SQL, it stays as a, as a sparse vector. And so I can actually load things in from Parquet files, preserving the schema. I can do SQL queries on them, you know, pull out specific columns, and then I can actually, you know, kind of uh, dump those directly into machine learning algorithms. So in addition to integrating with kind of the other parts of the Spark stack, we integrate quite tightly with other, other parts of the Hadoop ecosystem. Uh, in this example, I'm showing how you can connect to an Apache Hive database. Basically, all you need to do is take the hive.siteXML file, copy it into the configuration directory of, of your Spark distribution, and you're, you're connected to Hive. I can do DDL operations, so if I want to create tables or drop tables, if I want to load data into Hive, all of that works. And then I can actually express queries using HiveQL. Uh, so you know this is very similar to SQL. I often get questions about like, should I use HiveQL or should I use the SQL parser? The HiveQL parser is strictly uh, there's more features. It's kind of more a more complete implementation of SQL. Um, but in terms of performance, it actually doesn't matter. As soon as we parse it, it goes into the exact same logical format and is executed using exactly the same code path. Uh, so really, it's kind of just up to what you know which dialect of SQL you're most comfortable with. Uh, we also have Parquet compatibility. I would say this is kind of one of the best uh, supported formats. This is the one we've spent the most engineering effort on integrating. 
uh, with Spark SQL. So for those of you who aren't familiar with Parquet, it's, uh, it's this columnar format. It's based on a, a bunch of research done at Google uh, on the system called Dremel. And so the nice thing is Parquet is a very efficient format for storing uh, data columnarly, even if it's nested. So even if it contains kind of relatively complex nested or repeated structures, they have this kind of clever technique called repetition and definition levels that allow them to encode that efficiently so you can still jump to only the column you want to read. So when this kind of this sort of data format is really going to shine is if I've got a very wide table and I want to read you know some subset of the rows on any given query. We see kind of orders of magnitude speed up in terms of performance. Um, any schema RDD can be written to a parquet file, and all of the types are automatically preserved. So if I write out a string and an integer and they have column names, when I read it back in, all of that schema information is preserved and I can immediately start querying it. So when you're using something like parquet, uh, you don't have to write the kind of parsing code at the beginning of your job. So I think that's kind of another nice advantage here of this integration. So really kind of a, a very common pattern that I see uh, a lot of users uh, following is you know you've got this directory and it's full of JSON data. JSON's very efficient, or it's very flexible, so it's very easy for you as a programmer to kind of just dump data out. But now I want to run a bunch of interactive analytics over it. It's very slow to parse. It's kind of hard to work with because you don't understand the structure. So what people will do is they'll convert these slower data formats into Parquet and then do a bunch of uh, kind of repeated queries over them. So using it's pretty simple. Any schema RDD, you can just say save as Parquet file and give it a, a directory on your distributed file system or on S3. Um, and it'll, it'll write it out, preserving all the schema information. So that means when I load it back in, what I'm getting here is a schema RDD. So I can immediately register it as a table and start querying it using the names of the columns without doing any extra parsing. Yes? Yeah, so, okay, so that's a very good question. So the question was, do we support ORC files? ORC is kind of a, I think it's actually very similar in spirit to Parquet, uh, but it's the kind of Hive, Hive implementation of it. We do support it. Uh, we currently support it through the Hive Certi. So actually any Hive Certi you can use inside of Spark SQL. Um, there actually is also a pull request open for adding kind of native support so that you can use ORC files with Spark SQL um, without having to use Hive. And also so that kind of the integration is a little bit tighter. We do a better job of pushing down predicates and things. So I would expect the, uh, so you can use ORC today, but I would expect the native support to drop in the 1.3 release. Um, so another thing I've been talking about a bunch is JSON support. This has actually been uh, you know, one of the, the most hyped features, I think. It's kind of a cool research project done by a, a grad student at Ohio State that then kind of became the, this very useful tool. Um, on any SQL context, you know, just like sc.txt file, I can call uh, uh, spark uh, SQL context.json file, or if I've already got an RDD of strings where I've done some pre-processing, you can call JSON RDD. And what this is going to do is it's going to convert those JSON objects into Spark SQL rows. And the cool thing is it actually infers the schema for you. So the way it works is it first does a pass over the data to figure out all of the names and all of the types of all of the columns. If a column is always an integer, it'll figure that out and make that column an integer. If a column flips back and forth between integer and long, it'll make it a long. So it kind of does a relatively intelligent version of, of kind of type coercion to figure out kind of what the, the tightest schema representation is uh, uh, for, for any data set. Um, and then the nice thing is it also maintains the nested structure in arrays. So when I'm querying JSON data, I can still dot into my nested structures. I can use brackets to go into my arrays. And if it, it looks just like JSON, it's just much easier to query. Uh, so you know, in terms of how you actually use it, basically all I need to do is give a path uh, to, to a bunch of JSON files stored in your distributed file system. We automatically infer the schema, and then you can actually print it out. Uh, you know, a lot of people actually have JSON where they don't understand the structure. And so even just this ability to visualize the schema can be a very powerful tool. And then once it's loaded in, I can register it as a table. So other things that we're working on, so this is, uh, so that's kind of the, yes. Yeah, so, so they don't have to have exactly the same format. And really what I see in the wild is most JSON is like semi-structured but not completely unstructured. There's like five different schemas but not thousands of different schemas. This schema inference will not work well if there are thousands of different schemas. But if there's like only three or four, if a column gets added and removed, um, basically it'll just be null in the places it doesn't exist. And uh, you know, if we can't figure out what to do, we just fall back on keeping it as a string and giving you the data that was there. 
Um, so another thing, so you know, I've talked a lot about the different data sources that Spark SQL supports, but really there's kind of this very long tail of other data sources. There's Avro, there's Cassandra, there's HBase, you know, there's uh, Colossus, there's all sorts of things. So you want to be able to integrate with all these different sources. And so one of the, the cool new features in Spark 1.2 is this data sources API. Uh, as an example, I've actually published a library for doing Avro data. And so this is an example of how you can tightly integrate with the Spark SQL Query Planner, adding new data sources that kind of have full native support um, just by adding a library, kind of without even needing to add code into Spark. Uh, and you know, once you've done it, we've got this new syntax. You can create tables. You just say which library to use and give it a path. It automatically infers the schema and all of that. So you know, you know, this is one library we've made, but I'm actually really excited about the libraries that are coming from the community. I've seen HBase, I've seen Cassandra, I've seen JDBC. So I think uh, kind of this is going to be one of the, the highlights of the, of the 1.2 release. So I think I'm running out of time, so I'm going to go through this part really quick. But I just want to talk about some of the cool tricks we play under the covers to make Spark SQL faster. Um, you know, uh, one of the, the hard parts about doing SQL on top of the JVM is evaluating expressions. So something like A plus B could actually be really expensive. There's virtual function calls and branches and a whole bunch of things. So you know, if you think, for example, about doing an add of A plus B, uh, what actually happens under the covers, if you do this the naive way, is you, you, know, you call eval on add, you call eval on A, you return a boxed integer, so I've allocated an object for no good reason, I call eval on B, I allocate another boxed integer, so there's another object allocation, it's costing the GC a lot. I actually do the work, the integer addition, which is the cheapest part of this whole thing, and I return the result. Um, but that's actually, that's pretty slow. So one of the really cool things we're doing in Spark SQL is we actually have this mode where you can turn on code generation. And so we're actually using this really cool feature of Scala where you can actually take Scala code and splice it together at runtime. And so instead of doing that fairly expensive version, what you end up with is when you do A plus B, you actually end up with something like this where you load, an int you load two integers, you keep them as primitives, you do the addition using primitive addition, and then you, know, you store the result without ever doing an object allocation. So this means fewer function calls, uh, it means no boxing of primitives. Uh, if you look at this in terms of performance, um, this is a, a benchmark of adding A plus A plus A one billion times. So it's you know, a very simple micro benchmark. Um, but if you look at the interpreted evaluation case, it's pretty slow. Um, if I handwrite code to do it, I can get quite a bit faster. But the really cool thing is with Spark SQL Code Gen, without even having to handwrite the code, it'll actually automatically generate the code at runtime to do that kind of uh, you know, very, very tight, efficient evaluation. So you could say, oh, well, that's just a micro benchmark. That doesn't mean anything. So we also ran it on TPCDS. Uh, this is a very kind of large, comprehensive benchmark for doing kind of decision support. This is kind of like analytics. Um, and what you can see is across the board, Spark SQL is significantly faster, sometimes up to eight times as fast as other systems that were built on, on top of, uh, of Spark. So this is a comparison with Shark. It's actually quite competitive with Presto and Hive and a lot of these other systems as well. So I talked about this throughout, uh, what's coming in, in Spark 1.2, um, which is you know, hopefully could be coming out early December. Uh, we've got ML pipeline support. We've got these new APIs for data sources, full support for fixed precision decimal and the date type. We've got statistics for in-memory data so we can efficiently skip partitions, and just tons of bug improvements. I think kind of this is one of the cool things about being such a, a hot community project is there are tons of people using this in real deployments, and they're contributing back small bug fixes all the time. So that's my talk, um, and I'm happy to take more questions. Yes? Uh, so th there is not XML support at the moment, um, but I, like, I think really the nice thing here is if you've got XML data you want to read, because it's Spark, it should be relatively straightforward to use existing Java or Python XML parsers turn it into a schema RDD, and from there you can kind of do this pattern, save it as Parquet and do uh, more efficient queries over it, if it's something you want to do multiple times, um, or, or, you know, kind of, or just query it once. Uh, but yeah, so I'm, I'm hoping somebody will write an XML library as part of the, uh, the data sources API. Any other questions? Yeah. Well, so if you mean, so if, if one line is wrong, meaning that it won't parse, starting with Spark 1.2, we'll just skip that line. There's a special column called corrupted record, and the data will go there, and all the other columns will be null. So you can filter out corrupted records, or you can actually inspect them and figure out why they're corrupted. If it's different in that its schema is just way different, 
what you're going to do is you're actually going to kind of pollute your schema, and you're going to have a whole bunch of extra columns that uh, you know, the other records don't have. But if you're using Parquet, that actually ends up getting encoded somewhat efficiently if you're saving it back out. So there, there's kind of a trade-off here. But like really, the, the JSON support is designed mostly for the case where your schemas are similar but not exactly the same and not where they're wildly different. Am I out of time? Yeah. One more question if there, if there are any. Yes. Um, so yeah, so there was a question about like what you know whether this is like a, I guess like a data frame in pandas or uh, you know uh, kind of an R data frame. Um, so we are working. I think that's kind of the vision of the ML pipeline support is to make schema RDDs uh, look more like a pandas uh, data frame or, or an R data frame. So that's that's kind of ongoing work. Um, there you are. There are a lot of similarities because we've got kind of columns and rows. Uh, so yes, please stay tuned. If you've got ideas about things you want, like. You know, come and talk to us on the user list or the dev list. We'd love to hear more about use cases so we can, we can build this feature right. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>